Peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, today, we are going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. If you wanted to follow along in your scripture, these are great passages that teach us and guide our faith. Um, I remember having a, a conversation. It was kind of overhearing a conversation. Um, it was even when I was in seminary, actually, um, about the Christian life. Uh, that we are called to live, okay? And the, these two guys were sitting across from one another, and one of them was asking the question, so, um, you know, I believe in the Lord, I believe in, in, in Christ, but what, uh, what should I do? Okay, this person was not a, a member of the seminary, but the other person was. And I heard, him, I heard the guy say back, well, you're forgiven. And he said, yeah, but what do I do? You're like, what do you want me to do? Well, like, what should I do as a Christian? Right? And the guy said again, like, well, you're forgiven. And the guy said, yeah, but what am I called to do? And again, the guy said, you're forgiven. And I think he was trying to make a point, and I get it. I get the point, right? That uh, do in what sense, right? Like, what do I have to do to kind of earn my salvation? Nothing. You're forgiven. You're welcomed into God's family. You're welcomed into his household through the merits of Jesus Christ. So, so yeah, in some, in some senses, the question, like, what am I to do? You kind of have to follow it, like, by, well, with, for what? Right? And if the question is, like, what do I need to do for, to be saved? The answer is, believe this truth, that you're forgiven. But, if you stop there, you still have to ask the question, okay, if I am saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, if I am, uh, if I am called into his family by his pure love and forgiveness, then what do I get to do? And the scriptures have a lot to say about that, actually. And sometimes I think we, we kind of pretend like they don't, actually. Like, they, like they're only talking about um, how you might be saved how, well, freely by God's grace. But if you go through the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, every, almost every single book has a, a set of almost instructions by the end of them of what the Christian faith looks like. Okay, so if you look in uh, Romans, Romans 12 through 15, three chapters, is all from the Apostle Paul saying, now that you know the gospel, now that you know that you are saved, not by your works, but by his free grace, this is how God calls you to live. So Romans 12 through 15 addresses that and says, it says all sorts of beautiful things that instruct our lives in Christian obedience. Galatians chapter 5 uh, and 6, same thing. The Apostle Paul lays out instructions for Christians, and now that they know that their uh, salvation is not based on works, what does it look like then to live as a Christian? Ephesians chapter 5 is all about that. Colossians 3 and 4, almost half a book is, uh, is filled with instructions for what the Christian life looks like, what obedience and following God looks like. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 Peter 2 through 5. More than half the book is committed to what does it mean to live as a Christian? So don't mistake this. As Christians, God does give us all sorts of instructions on how to shape our lives. It's not just, um, you know, I believe in Jesus, and then Jesus has nothing to say to me. It's not like the, the race, you know, where uh, on your mark, get set, sit down. But instead, it's on your mark, get set, go, Right? And that is the, that, that's, the, that's the race and faith we're talk, talking about. And today, I want to uh, go through a passage of Scripture, uh, and, and I would commit these all to, to your own reading and meditation, okay? If you're, if you're a person who, uh, who wants to know, what does it look like to live out my faith? This is like a good starting reading list for you, okay? There's a lot more in the Scriptures about it. But this is a good starting reading list for what a Christian looks like, acts like, lives like, 
talks like. All sorts of things. He dress, dresses all this stuff. Uh, the, I would like to run through a, a passage of scripture to sort of think about how we can meditate on these ideas as a believer. Um, and it comes today from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The Apostle Peter writing to the church uh, about how to ground their faith and their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but then, in later chapters, just giving them, what does it look like for me to be a Christian? What are kind of the, some of the key tenets of belief and practice for me as a Christian? And that's what I want to look at and run through today, okay? So 1 Peter, verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Peter begins this way. He says, the end of all things is near. So if you're going to live your life as a Christian, if your life is going to be directed by God and by his instructions of walking in newness of life and faithfulness, here's where you should look and start and begin. Uh, he says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you might pray. Okay? He begins with prayer, uh, and we begin our Christian life and Christian walk. How then shall we live in prayer that is serious and alert. It almost, um, it's almost kind of striking to me, that this verse, where it says, therefore be alert and sober-minded so that you can. I'm expecting him to like give me some kind of grand instruction of some sort of action I can do. But instead, he says, be alert and sober-minded so that you can pray. Okay? Um, now, I don't know about you, but myself, even as a pastor, cultivating a life of prayer is not always an easy thing, right? How many of you have, have sat down and tried this? Maybe, maybe you've never tried it in your life because you're just uncertain what it might look like. But if you have tried it, I'm sure that you've gone through the uh, experience like I have, where you set out a time or maybe a couple of times during the day, maybe right when you wake up in the morning, the first 15 minutes of your day, you say, I'm going to commit uh, this time to prayer. Maybe the end of your day, you say, I'm going to uh, meet with my wife, I'm going to sit down uh, individually maybe, and I'm going to uh, bring to the Lord my prayers. And all of a sudden, as you sit down, uh, you begin into your prayer and you start talking, and then all of a sudden, um, the flash of the grocery list comes into your mind. Okay, or, uh, or that relationship uh, or that thing that you have been neglecting at work starts kind of nagging in your mind and uh, all of a sudden you don't know how your prayer ended but you've got a grocery list in front of you. Okay, or, you, um, or you're sitting on a, a, a computer trying to write somebody an email. Or um, you're thinking about, oh, I'm missing the, you know, the morning news. And all of a sudden, you've, you've never really ended your prayer. You're just sitting in front of the TV. I think that uh, the, the Apostle Peter, when he gives us this instruction, that if you're going to cultivate a life of prayer, start with alertness and sober-mindedness. Those are good instructions, actually. Because it's saying, okay, uh, alertness to prayer. It's kind of setting aside everything else and prioritizing. What does a conversation with God look like right now? How can I bring my life uh, my prayers, my petitions, the people that I desire to pray for, um, to the Lord, right? And, and has alertness to it, okay? And then also just a sober-minded seriousness that as I step into prayer, it is not, um, it's, it's, it's not something uh, that, that is flippant or to be taken lightly, all right, that, that we as Christians, when we go to prayer, that it is coming before the throne of God, coming before Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father, asking for intercession, praying to the Lord. That like you, if there's anybody, it's the most important conversation that you have. And so as you approach it, you approach it with, with seriousness and with soberness uh, as, you, uh, as you call out to the Lord. Those are two good instructions for a life of prayer. And I would just commit to you uh, that prayer, if you're a Christian and you desire to grow, you would desire to change, you desire to know the will of God, to discern uh, subjects or matters of faith in your life, take prayer very seriously. Um, John Edwards. One of, the, one of America's kind of most famous pastors with one of the finest pastoral hairdos uh, said this about prayer. He said, a prayer is as natural of an expression of faith 
as breathing is to life, right? That prayer is, is, is so essential to the life and vitality of your faith that it's like breathing, right? Like how long do you get, a lot, get on without breathing in your life? Not very long before you really start feeling empty, right? Um, fa- uh, prayer, is, prayer is like that for us as Christians. To so learn as a Christian, as you, as you walk in obedience and faith, to cultivate a life of, a life of prayer, Okay. Sometimes uh, the best way to do that is just sitting with the scriptures and reading one or two passages and letting that language guide your prayer life. Okay. Sometimes a prayer book. If you get if you get distracted, okay. Sometimes a prayer book to open up a prayer book and read through the prayer and let those words be your words and a platform for for praying. Okay. Do that or take single petitions of the Lord's prayer and say, Our Father who art in heaven. Let me stop on that idea for a minute. Remembering who I'm coming before. Remembering who I'm talking to so that I can be sober-minded in my prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Let me just pause for a minute on that word and pray to God and hallowed or holy or praise his name. This is just a way of practicing prayer, kind of keeping and cultivating a life of prayer in your own life. But it's that essential. And when the Apostle Peter gives instructions for what the Christian life looks like. The first thing he says is pray. Okay? Learn the art of praying. Next. He says this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So, the second thing he calls us to is love that is deep and that is forgiving. This probably shouldn't surprise us since Jesus himself talks a lot about love, uh, talks a lot about uh, loving our neighbors, talks a lot about loving God, talks a lot about loving our enemies, even. Uh, So the Apostle Peter is just following the suit of Jesus, saying, if you are walking in faith, walking in trust in Jesus, then obedience looks like love. It looks like loving those around you and being intentional about that. Now, I think that this is, this is a really beautiful line, actually, right? It's a very beautiful verse if you're going to commit something to memory. Above all, love each other deeply because, why? Love covers a multitude of sins. And I wonder how that is, right? How is it that, that love covers a multitude of sins? You know, I think that um, in relationships, if you think about it, Right? If you sin against somebody, or if you do wrong, or you neglect somebody who, uh, who is a neighbor or a fellow, uh, fellow Christian, in order for that to be covered and forgiven, they have to love you. Right? They have to love you and forgive you. So love covers a multitude of sins because Christians love one another and cover our faults. Simultaneously, when somebody sins against you, you love them enough to address it and forgive that person. Right? And I think that you'll realize uh, if you kind of live long enough and if you live in relationship with other Christians long enough that your relationship will have all sorts of problems, all sorts of issues, all sorts of sins, all sorts of unreconciled things that God will cover with love. Right? You think about your marriage, for example. Right? If, you have, if you have a spouse. How many times have you done your spouse wrong in life? Probably a lot. But do you remember and recall them and think about them and bring them up all the time? No, actually. And you can be married for a very long time and all sorts, sins and and problems and issues can be worked out, forgiven and renewed because we make a commitment to love each other deeply. Okay? And this word for love, uh, as you you may have guessed or may know, uh, is the kind of specific kind of Christian love that's called agape, self-sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that Jesus showed to us, and necessarily the kind of love that we are called to and have to show one another. Uh, The kind of love that lays down our lives, the kind of love that sacrifices and says, even though I'm hurt, uh, even though, even though, even though that didn't feel good, I am going to pursue reconciliation and forgiveness because I love you. That's the kind of sacrificial love that lays down its, its own life for those around us. So above all, love each other deeply because there's this promise behind it. 
that love covers a multitude of sins. He says this in verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So I say the next instruction for our life as Christians is to be hospitable in a gracious way. Now the reality is, uh, you know, hospitality, hospitality is just welcoming somebody into your life, welcoming somebody into uh, to your home, welcoming somebody into like your kind of existence or group or whatever. Uh, that's what hospitality essentially means as a Christian, is welcoming a stranger into your life. Now, the reality is that that can look a lot of ways, okay? That can look on Sunday morning like uh, when you see somebody you don't know that you, sh you shake their hand and ask them who they are and find out a few things and welcome them into your life, your church, your place, Okay, it may be saying uh, after a while, hey, would you like to come over for a meal? I would like to get to know you a little bit better. I'd like to know who you are and sharing your life with them. It might mean something as essential as, uh, I don't know, sitting in the center and not on the sides of the rows, <laughs> you know, to give people places to sit. That's, a, that's like, those are little things that offer hospitality. But what I've noticed about hospitality is that, um, it is inherently like a little bit inconvenient, actually. Right? And, if you, and some of you are given to it, and you are very, very good at hospitality. Others of you, I, I know, and uh, maybe you're kind of like, like me, and hospitality is just like a little bit uncomfortable. The idea of like opening up my life, shaking somebody's hand, asking who they are, remembering things about them, pursuing them, calling them, whatever. You know, that sort of hospitality makes you sort of like heart flutter, I need to uh, get in a space by myself, you know, sort of situation. It is. It, uh, that, that's just the reality of hospitality. There's a, there's a level of challenge to it. There's a level of discomfort for it, okay? I'll give you a brief story about hospitality. Um, there was... Uh, once I was, I was working at a church and I had just started um, in this job and was kind of having all sorts of questions uh, about my job, uh, un uh, uncertainty about my life and some of the, the things uh, that were happening in my life. I was back in my home state and I was just really unsure about who I was and what I was doing and where I was going. And I was going into like a little bit of a crisis. And I remember um, I... I felt like, man, I should go talk to my pastor at this church about this. And, um, and I, I went in to his office, and I sat down and said, Pastor Mark, I, I just, I've got a lot of things I talked to you about. I'm really unsure. I, re I really don't know what I'm doing. And just, just, just dumped on him, okay? Just dumped on him for like half an hour. I have this ability to talk in half an hour to an hour spurts, as you know. Um, and just, just unloaded on him. And then I, I kind of talked my way. I don't know if he said one thing the entire time. And then I paused. And I kind of looked around. I never really noticed. I said, like, this is a nice office. You have a nice office. And he said something that was kind of profound. He said, it's for you. It's for you, my, my office is. And I thought about it for a second, and I looked around again, and I noticed that uh, his lunch was sitting on his desk. Uh, he had it all wrapped out, like one bite taken out of it. Um, and then I had just barged in, taken over his, like, his entire lunch hour, uh, and kind of inconvenienced him with my own blabbering for, for half an hour. But when he said that this space that I've made, my office, is for you. It's for people like you. I keep it calm. I keep it open. I keep it, I keep it clean. I, I keep my hours open so that you might have a place and a space to be welcomed into. Right? And that is a picture kind of, of hospitality to me. Somebody who just thinks about and kind of cultivates their life in order so that other people might be able to come into it. So that other people might be able to have a space to rest, a space to unload, a space and a person and a life to share and talk to. Right? That's a picture of hospitality. 
And it's a hospitality that doesn't do it begrudgingly. But looks and says like, God has done this for me. So I'm going to do it for others. Right? I think about Jesus' words in, um, in John 15 or John 14 when he's telling his disciples this. He says, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Uh, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. That I, I would not have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way and the place where I am going. What's Jesus doing here? He's talking about his own hospitality. Right? He's saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you that you might be with me. I'm going to open up my life and my heart and my home and eternity for you. And I think about this idea that like, it, it can be inconvenient to, to, be, uh, to be hospitable. It can be in, inconvenient to welcome people into our lives. And consider this, that in order for Jesus to welcome us into his life, in order to, for him to welcome us to interni into eternity, where was the place that he was going? He was going to the cross to lay down his life for us, that eternity and, and openness and uh, communion with he and the Father might be open to us. Jesus is the paradigm for hospitality that says, it may take sacrifice to open up my life, but I will do it nonetheless because of what Christ has done for me. Okay? Um, and then finally, uh, Peter says this. In just his, he has a lot more to say on this subject but says uh, that a Christian life that asks, how then shall I live, will do so in service that glorifies God. And he describes it kind of beautifully. He says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So he begins by talking about service as a gift that each one of us have, have uh, been given, gifts to serve God with. Um, so whoever... Uh, each of you should, should use whatever gift he has received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And then he gives kind of two descriptions of how this can look. He says, if anyone speaks, uh, they should speak so as one uh, who speaks uh, with the very words of God. And if anyone serves, they should do so with the, uh, with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I think that Peter's saying there are basically kind of two sorts of people in this world. You've got talkers and you've got doers, right? And maybe as you hear those, you sort of like fit into one category or another. Uh, that maybe you do have a gift that God has given you with words to be able to teach, to be able to share, to be able to talk, to be able to encourage, to be able to craft words in order to glorify and strengthen God's people. That's important. Use that. We use our words all the time for useless things, to talk about pointless stuff, right? Peter's calling us to something higher. If you're a speaker, if you're a talker, even in just in person-to-person -person conversation, how do you use your words to speak the very words of God to one another, right? To encourage and share and lift up and build up the saints of God, right? You may be a speaker, Use that for God's glory. But you might not be a speaker, and you still don't get out of it, okay? Because you might be a doer. You might be a person who just says, like, I, you know what I like to do? I just like to crank out tasks. I don't like to talk about it too much. I just like to do things. I just like to, like to do good deeds, right? I like to serve people. Good! St. Francis, he, says, uh, he said once, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Okay? You may be a doer who can just look around and say, like, how can I serve an individual? I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm not going to be able to, like, talk for, for hours or share with somebody or sit and listen and counsel. But you know what? I can see needs that people have. And I want to help those. I want to serve people in those, right? Peter's saying, if you have that, then live it. Show it. Share it. Okay, and use the strength that God provides to do that, right? To look around and say, these are ways that I can serve somebody. And it may start small, 
Okay, it may just be like at the beginning of the week, you pray and say, God, would you show me somebody who I can serve this week? And then talk and figure out, okay, hey, um, may, maybe I can help this person. And then go do it with the strength that God gives you. And if you set yourself to do that every day or every week just once, wow, you can have a profound impact on your community and the people around you. Just once a week, once a day, saying, who can I serve in a little way or a big way? Once a month, saying, how can I do something big maybe for those around me, right, to serve? I think you change the course of your neighborhoods and your relationships around you. And you might even get to say something in the midst of it, okay? So this is Peter. He's just giving us the answer. He's helping us answer the question, how then shall we live, right? And this is a good starting place in prayer, in love, in hospitality, and service. I pray that you take those words seriously and run the race of faith as a Christian, okay? Would you join me uh, in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ, that you have gifted us with so many great and wonderful gifts. May we use uh, those gifts to your glory and to the extension of your kingdom. God, if we are speakers, teach us to speak with your words to the people around us. If we are doers, Lord, help us to serve, uh, just as your Son served, um, and serve those around you to the glory and praise of you. May you receive glory and power forever and ever. Amen.